Okay, our final presenter is Ryan Ronald Schechter. He is Associate Professor of History at the College of William and Mary, where he's taught for the past 20 years. He is author of Obstinate Hebrews, Representations of Jews in France, 1715 to 1815, which won the David Pickney Prize, awarded by the Society for French Historical Studies, um, and also the Leo Gershoy um, Award, presented by the AHA. He is editor of The French Revolution, The Essential Readings, and also editor and translator of Nathan the Wise by Lessing. Um, his most recent book is A Genealogy of Terror in 18th Century France, which is forthcoming with the University of Chicago Press. His talk today is called A Jewish Architect of Victory, Jacob Benjamin, the Armée du Midi, and the Politics of Food, 1792 to 1793. Thank you, Angela. Uh, and I'm very happy to see Gail Bossinga because she gave me the idea of calling um, Jacques Benjamin an architect of victory. So on June 11, 1792, the French minister of war, Joseph Servant, made a deal with a Jewish army contractor named Jacques Benjamin. According to the terms of the agreement, Benjamin was to supply the roughly 30,000 soldiers in the Army of the South with half a pound of meat every day for six months. The deliveries were to begin on July 1st and end on January 1st, 1793, leaving Benjamin less than three weeks to begin amassing enough meat to feed an army, literally. The contract charged Benjamin with the challenging task of supplying the meat, whether the soldiers were gathered on the borders or in foreign countries or in fortresses. That's the wording of the contract. The deal was worth approximately 1.3 to 1.5 million livres, and the war minister had enough trust in Benjamin to advance him 300,000 livres. More to the point, um, at this precarious time, Servant trusted Benjamin enough to leave the nourishment of an entire army to him. Now, in some respects, this is surprising because uh, less than a year earlier, the National has Assembly had finally voted to accord equal political rights to Jews. Uh, a decision taken after much debate about whether the Jews could ever be trustworthy citizens. At the same time, Servant had reason to trust Benjamin, to trust that he would faithfully carry out the terms of the contract. Benjamin had plenty of capital. Uh, his father-in-law was rumored to have lent the Comte de Narbonne, Servant's predecessor as Minister of War, 150,000 livres between 1786 and 1792. Benjamin had other Jewish businessmen a stand surety for him in contracts, and he did the same for them. He reciprocated. He oversaw roughly 300 employees and had an extensive network of subcontractors. Servant wasn't the only military official to trust Benjamin, who supplied at least three other armies, the Army of the Rhine, the Army of the Center, and the Army of the South, with a wide variety of goods. In deals signed by the chief pay commissioner of the Army of the South in September 1792, Benjamin agreed to supply 500 cavalry horses, as well as over 2,000 leather satchels, 1,000 tents, and 1,800 beds. Benjamin sold the same army 12,800 pairs of linen stockings and an equal number of shoes. He would also take on the task of provisioning the fortressed alpine city of Briançon with 8,000 pounds of salt beef and 3,600 pounds of salt pork. 
And I'm sure a lot could be said about a recently emancipated Jew going into the pork business. Mm -hmm. But that's not my subject today. Benjamin also agreed to furnish Briançon with 300 sheep, 24,600 pounds of rice, 48,000 pounds of dried vegetables, 30,000 pounds of potatoes, and 192,000 pints of wine. He promised to supply 1,200 pounds of tobacco. And since the tobacco is useless if you don't have pipes, Benjamin sold the army 6,000 pipes. But at some point in the fall of 1792, French trust in Benjamin began to waver. On November 8, 1792, Deputy Pierre-Joseph Cambon, in his capacity as a member of the Finance Committee, accused Benjamin of profiteering and persuaded his fellow legislators to summon the contractor, whom Cambon referred to as Le Juif Benjamin, to the bar of the National Convention. On November 13th, Benjamin addressed a formidable array of revolutionaries, including future terrorist Hero de Seychelles, Billot Varenne, and Talian, and explained his prices. The convention was unmoved and placed Benjamin under arrest. After more than three weeks in solitary confinement somewhere in Paris, Benjamin was sent to Lyon where he would be tried, in the words of the indictment against him, for having stolen the funds of the republic and compromised the external security of the state. Now, these were serious charges, almost as serious as treason. And in wartime, one could imagine, could easily have carried with them the penalty of death. But on January 22nd, 1793, the day after Louis XVI was executed, Jacques Benjamin was acquitted. Now, I've told the story of Jacques Benjamin's trial in a recent chapter of a volume edited by uh, Tzvi, Jonathan Kaplan, and Nadia Malinovich. But today, I'd like to focus on an aspect of that story that I didn't say much about in that essay. And specifically, uh, I want to talk about the politics of military rations, since this topic might help to explain why Benjamin was acquitted. A key document for understanding how important military rations were to soldiers and officers alike comes from Benjamin's wife, Agathe. At some point between November 13th and December 7th, 1792, uh, while her husband was incarcerated in an undisclosed location, Madame Benjamin published an open letter titled La Femme de Jacques Benjamin à la Convention Nationale. The two stated goals of this extraordinary document almost certainly the first published work by a Jewish woman in France, were, first, persuading the convention to establish a tribunal at which Jacob could prove his innocence, and two, having the convention reinstate the contract for the supply of Briançon, which it had canceled on November 13th. I could say a lot about this document, which really shows a deep understanding of uh, Benjamin's business and skillfully appeals to public opinion. But I would like to focus on a series of petitions that Agat appended to the open letter. And these petitions testified to the high quality of the meat Benjamin provided and to its importance for the soldier's morale. Now, the first of these testimonials was signed by, and I'm quoting, the undersigned commandants of officers, quartermasters, adjutants, sergeants, 
and soldiers of the line regiments and National Guard battalions of the Army of the Alps. In other words, a diverse group of aristocrats and commoners, career soldiers, and volunteers. These men had, according to the petition, learned with great pain that Sieur Benjamin, general supplier of food and meat to the Army of the Alps, is, we have been told, intending to submit his resignation, or might fear being supplanted by envy and jealousy. Now, this document was signed on October 16th, nearly a month before Benjamin had been summoned to the National Convention. So it must be referring to some other opposition that he faced. And I don't know the details about this. The, sign the signatories attested to the truth, exactitude, and high quality of his service, and affirmed that this service of meat supply is absolutely the only one that has been able to earn the praise and satisfaction all the troops. And the petitioners added that it would be very unfortunate to see them deprived by machinations indicated by the avarice and greed of reckless people, and to expose the military service to new and continual discontent, which would be dangerous for the officers in general, but above all, for those charged with livestock and with the trust of the regiments and battalions of the army. And so essentially the petitioners are suggesting that should a good meat supplier be replaced by a bad one, there's a risk of mutiny. The petitioners didn't want quartermasters and other officers to be responsible for holding back the turmoil and the discontent of the soldier. And they added that meat, together with soup, was one of the substantive and capital foods of the troops. The signatories implored the general commanding the Army of the Alps, as well as the staff and the pay commissioners of the Army, to pass their complaint on to the national legislature, to the convention, in order that new discontent in these delicate and difficult circumstances not be felt by the troops. And they ended with appeals to their duty, humanity, and love for their brothers in arms, as well as their love of liberty and equality. But just below the surface was the threat of disobedience. Another petition that Agathe reproduced in her open letter was more succinct. Signed by the administrative council of the 3rd Battalion of the Gironde, it is sure that the manner in which citizen Benjamin has fulfilled the service of supplying meat is absolutely superior, both in the quality of the meat and the zeal and exactitude of the delivery to all other suppliers. The petition added that the good of the military service and the interest of all the military men could only suffer infinitely if this service passed into other hands. And finally, a fourth pet petition, signed by the Maréchal de Camp and 30 soldiers and officers of the 1st Battalion of Lisère, declared Benjamin and one other supplier, somebody named Bourdeau, to be the only ones who have acquitted themselves well of their functions in the supply and distribution of meat. Now, when I first read that contract that obligated Benjamin to supply a half a pound of meat to every soldier in the Army of the South um, for every, every day for six months, I was surprised. Because after all, meat was a luxury for the vast majority of people in 18th century France. Uh, according to Vincent Knapp, prior to 1800, meat consumption in Europe was mainly a matter of privilege. The aristocracy and the upper middle class, who had discretionary incomes, were clearly meat eaters, 
but the masses were for the most part without meat. Vauban wrote in 1700, ordinary people only eat meat three times a year. Matters were not much different nearly a century later. When an Anglican priest conducted a study of nutrition among farm workers in Berkshire, he discovered that they consumed roughly two ounces of meat weekly. And that was in England, a country that prided itself on its beef production. The soldiers in the French Army of the South had most likely eaten meat only rarely, if at all, prior to volunteering for military service. In fact, the prospect of regular meals of meat might have been one of the principal incentives for their decision to join the army. And this helps to explain Servant's insistence on half a pound of meat for his soldiers. Meat would be insurance against mutiny and desertion. However cold, homesick, frightened, or bored the soldiers were in their remote alpine camps, they could comfort themselves with the realization that they had never eaten so well. As it turns out, Servant did not invent the idea, the War Minister Servant did not invent the idea of providing daily half-pound meat rations to soldiers. The Marquis de Fouquier wrote in his Maxime sur la guerre at the turn of the 18th century that each soldier should receive half a pound of meat per day. In 1754, the infantry captain Ray de Saint-Genis recapitulated this rule in, in L'art de la guerre, L'art de la guerre pratique, though with the amendment that no meat should be served on Friday, presumably in accordance with Catholic practice. In 1772, a colonel in the Saxon army published a compilation of rules and principles of the art of war in which he recommended Saint-Genis version of the meat ration. Of course, the recommendation of military theorists did not guarantee that in practice soldiers would receive half a pound of meat per day. And even if they did, quantity was not enough there was such a thing as bad meat. Yet the petitioners whom Agathe Benjamin cited in her open letter to the convention praised uh, both the regularity and the quality of her su husband's supplies. Presumably, other suppliers delivered lower quality meat or were inconsistent in their deliveries or both. How did Benjamin manage to satisfy the soldiers' desire for regular rations of high-quality meat? The contract Benjamin signed with War Minister Servant provides some clues. Together with other business papers, the contract with Servant was confiscated by order of the convention, then sent to the Minister of Justice, who in turn sent the papers on to the prosecutor in Lyon. And it remains in the Archive Départementale du Rhône. And that's how I know what I know, for the most part, about Benjamin's business. To begin with, the contract hints at the scale of Benjamin's business. Benjamin likely brought in cattle from Germany. Since the contract specified that he would be reimbursed for any import duties he had to pay as long as he provided the receipts. As an Ashkenazi Jew, Benjamin had access to Yiddish-speaking trade networks and therefore had a larger selection of cattle from which to, to choose. Unlike locally-based butchers who would have supplied whatever they had at hand, Benjamin could draw on a wider range of sources. The contract also allowed Benjamin or his representatives as well as his employees or butchers apprentices to be lodged at no cost at the headquarters and its environs. And this also, I think, attests to the size of Benjamin's operation. 
uh, Benjamin even had his own butchers who went to the camps and butchered the meat and uh, were allowed to stay there at no cost. Benjamin apparently supervised at least some of these employees at the encampments. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have requested free lodging for himself. Uh, this suggests that he had a personal relationship with the soldiers, who, after all, do mention him by name in their petitions. Benjamin also may have endeared himself to the soldiers by subsidizing gifts of meat that went beyond the half-pound rations. According to the contract with Servant, Benjamin's meat, and bear with me for a moment, Benjamin's meat was more expensive if it did not include the head and the pluck, fraisure, of the animal. The pluck consisted of the heart, liver, lungs, and other edible soft contents of the animal's body cavities. So to be precise, a pound of meat that excluded the head and the pluck uh, cost 10 sous and 10 deniers per pound, whereas a pound of meat that included these lower quality elements cost only 10 sous and 3 deniers, or about 5% less. But Benjamin offered to take 10 sous, 9 deniers per pound, if the head and pluck were given for free to the soldiers, in addition to their regular rations. So what this meant was that if the army paid an extra six deniers per pound for the highest quality meat and gave the head and pluck to the soldiers as a gift, Benjamin would contribute one denier. And so, pardon me for the math problem here. I had to do it a couple of times to figure this out. But uh, what this means is that Benjamin was subsidizing this gift by close to 15%. And altogether, this would have cost Benjamin 10,000 livres. Now, whether this was a patriotic gesture or simply good public relations, it may have contributed to Benjamin's popularity with the soldiers. Not only do you get your, ten, your half a pound of meat, good meat, every day, uh, but you also get this extra gift that you can put in the soup, right? So, and although the head and pluck were obviously inferior and hence cheaper than the rest of the meat, they could be used in soups, which, as we saw from that first petition that Agathe Benjamin published, were among the capital foods of soldiers, right? Meat and soup. Whatever the reasons for the high regard with which soldiers and officers held Benjamin's meat delivery service, that high regard was likely a factor in his acquittal. Although I don't have the time to go into the case in detail, I can say that the defendant faced formidable opponents. Deputy Cambon had spent considerable political capital in accusing Benjamin who, in Cambon's view, would expose corruption in an army dominated by aristocrats. And other members of the convention wanted to see Benjamin punished as well. Uh, the Minister of Justice himself, Gara, sent hundreds of documents relating to Benjamin's business activities to the prosecutor in Lyon and urged him to move quickly. Meanwhile, several commissioners from the convention testified to having inspected shoddy merchandise. Uh, we're not talking about meat now, we're talking about shirt, shirts and shoes that Benjamin had sold to the army. And their testimony was included in the documents sent to the prosecutor and the judge in Lyon. And during the trial, the prosecutor presented samples of that merchandise to the court. But despite all of this, Benjamin was acquitted. And while it's impossible to enter into the minds of the jurors, it's conceivable that they considered Benjamin too important to the soldiers, and hence to the survival of the Republic to be punished. And it is also conceivable that Benjamin's reputation for supplying high-quality meat 
to the Republic's soldiers played a, a large role in their decision to find him innocent. <laughs>